In the last week of Jesus' life, before his death and resurrection, he must have felt the full range of human emotions. Emotions spanning from ecstasy on the one hand to agony on the other. One writer describes it this way. The gospel writers paint their portraits of Jesus using a kaleidoscope of brilliant emotional colors. Jesus felt compassion. He was angry, indignant, and consumed with zeal. He was troubled, greatly distressed, very sorrowful, depressed, deeply moved and grieved. He sighed, he wept and sobbed, he groaned, he was in agony, he was surprised and amazed. He rejoiced very greatly and was full of joy. He greatly desired and he loved. It's interesting that in our desire to follow Jesus, we often overlook the emotionality of our Lord and Savior. But he was fully God and he was fully human. And in his humanness, he felt the full range of emotions that you and I feel, and yet without sin. And of course, this is so clearly evident in the final week of Jesus' death and resurrection. It was particularly evident in a series of events that begin on Palm Sunday. The day begins with what may be described as sheer ecstasy, feelings of jubilation, but along the way there is sadness and it ends in anger. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was a two-mile journey from the little village of Bethpage into the city. Jesus was sitting upon a young donkey. As, any, as he made his way, the pilgrims began to gather and the fest, they were there for the Passover festival. And as they gather around him, as he makes the trek, excitement begins to grow. In the past several days, there seems to have been a revival of interest in Jesus as the people's Messiah. In the weeks leading up to this, most had given up on the notion of Jesus as Messiah. He didn't talk about overthrowing Rome, their expectation of a Messiah. He didn't talk about a physical, political kingdom, their notion of what the Messiah would bring. But now in the past several days, rumors had begun to circulate. And some said, maybe we've given up on him too quickly. And so the pilgrims began to gather. They began to wave their patriotic palm branches in the air. The triumphalistic chants began to sound, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There was a crescendo of excitement as Jesus rode past the crowds, waving their palm branches as he makes his way towards Jerusalem. Emotions are running high. But for Jesus, all is not well. According to Luke's gospel, we read that he got to a certain point along the journey and he looked out at the crowds of people, and he looked toward the city of Jerusalem, and even the temple, and he began to weep. Because he knew that the crowds shouting Hosanna would in a very short time shout, crucify him, crucify him. As Jesus was processing along the way into the city, he would have been able to see the temple. And from that vantage point, it looked no doubt Dazzling, beautiful, resplendent. But when he gets down to the city and enters the temple, it is anything but beautiful. Mark's gospel tells us that it is actually the next day that he gets to the temple. He evidently went down to the city, and then he came back the next day. And we read in Matthew 21, after the, immediately after the triumphal entry, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the branches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. What Jesus encounters that day is the utter abuse 
of biblical faith, the sacrilege of the most esteemed institution, the temple. The temple area where all of this occurs is in the outer court. The temple, as you recall, had various courts, and there were limitations who could go in to the various parts of the temple. But the outer court was the place where Gentiles could come. Beyond that, there were other courts that were restricted, limited to the Jews, some limited to the priests, and of course, the Holy of Holies entered only one time a year by the high priest. Jesus' encounter here takes place in the outer court. It was crowded. It was busy with people from all over the then known world coming to Passover. Even Gentiles would often come for the festivities. After all, the temple was famous throughout the Roman world and Roman writers would describe it as one of the world's most amazing buildings. And so for Passover, it was not only Jews that had come, but Gentiles as well. And on this day, what Jesus found infuriated him. There was a brisk trade going on, and in the process, there was great exploitation. Beyond that, Gentiles who had come to the table, who had come rather to the temple, were not able to see its true meaning and its true significance. What was happening, evidently, were two kinds of trade in which there was a great deal of exploitation. The one was money changing. Every Jew had to pay a temple tax around Passover time, and if by a certain date they had not paid it, it could be paid at the temple itself. It needed to be paid in the proper currency. And of course, in and of itself, there was no problem with all of this. The problem was the money changers in the temple court knew they had the people over the barrel. And so when they came in, they would charge them exorbitant prices to change the money into the proper currency and to pay the temple tax. I suspect it was somewhat like what I encountered a few weeks ago when we were in Los Angeles. Marianne and I were returning our rental car back to uh, Hertz at the LAX airport. And of course, you have to fill the car up before you return it. It's pretty hard to find gas stations along the major throughways of Los Angeles. And so I got to the Hertz place, the GPS led us there. I had to find gas somewhere. I went one block down the street, there was a gas station, $4.79 a gallon. I kid you not. I wasn't about to pay $4.79. I drove a half mile further and I found gas for $2.69. I was nearly on empty. I filled it up and I saved Gordon Conwell $30. <laughs> it was very clear what was going on. Same thing that was happening in the temple that day. The people had no choice. They had to pay the temple tax. I had to get my gas. The second kind of trading that was going on had to do with the selling of doves for sacrifice. Any animal offered had to be without blemish. And there were official inspectors in the temple who had actually come through and they would check to make sure that the doves that were being brought for sacrifices were up to par, were kosher, that they had no blemishes. And no doubt what was going on was that officials inside would look at the dove you had brought from the outside and said, sorry, doesn't meet the qualifications. It's not pure enough. It's not good enough. And so they would have to go over to where those were selling the doves were at work. And they would buy in the temple courtyard itself a dove to offer the sacrifice. The problem once again, you had to pay an exorbitant price. It was a racket going on. The religious officials were doing nothing about it. As a matter of fact, they may have been in cahoots with it. They may have been getting paid off in the process for it. And so, after this great triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as Jesus now comes into the temple, he is angry, he is furious at the injustice the exploitation that was occurring in the confines of this great religious institution. In the midst of a temple that was to remind people 
of God's mercy, there was no human mercy. Beyond that, there was great detriment to God's work within the world. As I noted, the outer court was the only part of the temple Gentiles would ever see. And no doubt, some of them came to Jerusalem spiritually hungry, seeking for reality, seeking for hope. The temple seemed to be the place where they could find that. It was the symbol of hope. And when they get there, all they find, rather than worship and prayer, is religious huckstering. What they saw was a gross violation of the very meaning of the temple and of God's work in human history. And so Jesus was angry. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He threw over the benches of those selling the doves. And in what must have been a loud and a passionate voice, he cried out, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. But what in the world are we to make of this outburst? I thought Jesus was a savior of love. He exemplified love. Even to the point of the cross, he talked continually about the importance of love. He summed up the whole law of the Old Testament in terms of love for God and love for neighbor. You go only a few chapters earlier and he tells a parable about a shepherd who has such compassionate love that he leaves the 99 sheep and he goes and finds the one lost sheep in his tender mercy. And yet we come to this glorious day of Palm Sunday in the aftermath and Jesus is hopping mad. His anger is evident. What do we do with it? After all, I didn't think Christians are supposed to get angry. Well, Jesus is indeed a savior of love. In him was manifest the greatest, the purest love the world has ever known. But the love of God and the love of Christ is not sentimental love characterized by tolerance of whatever is. Today there is a tendency, I think, in our culture to think of love as tolerance. That somehow I'm being a loving person if I simply tolerate the wrong, the sin, the abuses around me. In our time, tolerance has no doubt become the overriding value and sentiment. But as G.K. Chesterton once put it, tolerance is the virtue of the person without convictions. Tolerance is the virtue of the person without convictions. You see, such flimsy tolerance, so-called love, is hardly true love. In Christ, in the triune God, love and anger come from the same source. They are part of God's holiness. They are both part of God's passionate nature. The same God who loved us is the same God who became angry at human evil, injustice, sin, unrighteousness, and exploitation. And that is why Paul in, the Roman, in Romans, the 11th chapter, verse 22 said, Consider, therefore, the kindness and the severity of God. Both are part of God's nature. We, of course, are bothered a great deal by the notion of God's wrath and his judgment. But God's goodness and his holiness involve both his love and his righteous indignation. For you cannot affirm holiness and tolerate evil, at least in the body of Christ. We expect it in the larger world. But you cannot affirm holiness and tolerate evil. It is a logical contradiction. And so the anger of Jesus and his love are in continuity with each other. They belong together. I find it somewhat of an irony that at the same time we began to not talk about God's wrath in history, namely the 20th century, was the very same time when the greatest mass atrocities and mass evils in human history have occurred. 20th century, by far, the bloodiest history, uh, the bloodiest century in human history. And I wonder, could there be a correlation? 
Could there be a correlation between the fact that humans wanted a flimsy love that dropped God's anger out of his holiness and the realities of evil that we now know in the modern world? For you see, love without anger is sloppy, sentimental love that has no standards. It's a love of feelings only, good feelings that make us feel nice, but that's about all. And a love with anger is a passionate love with direction and boundaries. It's a love with conviction, a love with definition, and a love with power. And of course, an anger without love is self-serving, uncontrollable anger. It is anger directed primarily at a person or thing that has gotten in our selfish way. It's a vented anger, an anger that all too often turns to violence, to ugliness, to abuse, and to a history of hostilities. The anger that Jesus showed this day at the temple was an important kind of anger. It was not an anger at people who had stepped on his toes or at people who had limited his selfish ambitions or who had marred his narcissistic pride or who had cut him off while he was driving on Route 128. The anger of Jesus was a pure anger that was directed to the sins and the exploitation and the injustice and the spiritual damage all of those that were antithetical to the core of his very being. And those were the things that were happening that day in the temple courtyard. And the very source of that anger against the wrong was the very same source of the love that would take him to the cross five days later. The outburst at the temple on Monday And the Father, I forgive them, on Friday were not contradictions. They are both the passions of a passionate, holy Lord and Savior. So much so that he hated and was angry at the sins and justices of the human race. And so much so that he would hang on a cross in love and bear the penalty of all of those sins and the righteous indignation of God, and take it upon himself on Good Friday. Even in our text, it's interesting that love and anger go together. After he cleanses the temple, we come to verse 14, and we read, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. And throughout the gospel accounts, when you have healings of Jesus, It often involves two things. On the one hand, it is a sign that indeed God had come into this world in the person of Jesus. He indeed was divine. He was the Son of God. But time and time again throughout the gospel accounts, his healing was a demonstration of his love. He would look out in compassion to those who were lame and who were sick and who were struggling physically and emotionally and spiritually in life, and he would reach out in his tender mercies and he would heal them. And so here in the temple, that very day after he has scattered the people abroad because of their wrongs and their sins and their injustices, the blind, the lame come to in the temple, and in his tender mercy, he heals them. So we ask the question, what in the world does all of this mean for us in our lives as we live this Holy Week in 2017? Well, I suggest we will never learn true love without a proper anger. And we will never learn a proper anger without real, genuine, Christ-like love. In us, love and anger come from the heart of our emotional being, being created in the image of God. We are created with the same emotions that Jesus himself exhibited this day. But of course, for us, there's a big problem. We are fallen creatures, and therefore our love is often a jaded love. Our anger is much too often a distorted anger. For most of us, anger is not a passionate response to sin, injustice, 
unrighteousness from God's perspective. It is usually an unbridled response from a very human fallen perspective. Most of the time, we get angry for the wrong reasons and in the wrong ways. Aristotle, the philosopher, who was by no means anything close to a believer, once said with a lot of wisdom, anyone can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not easy. And if we are honest, I think most of us would have to say that often our anger is selfish, pride, proud, unprincipled anger. Too often it is uncontrolled anger, so evident in recent months in our own society. And in the midst of our anger, we forget that marvelous admonition from Ephesians, the fourth chapter. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And when we are angry for the wrong reasons, with the wrong objects, to the wrong degree, we usually suffer the consequences. We lose peace with the other person. We lose peace within ourselves, and we lose peace with our God. Our anger becomes rage that tends to control us, and we become enslaved by it. That was not at all the anger that Jesus expressed this day in the temple. The story is told that when Leonardo da Vinci was painting the Last Supper, at one occasion he became angry with a man who had lashed out at him. Da Vinci even threatened him. He tried to go back to his work after his outburst of anger, and he was working on the face of Jesus. He found he couldn't paint. Numerous times he would take up that brush, he would dip it in the oils, and he would go at it, and nothing would come. Everything had stopped. All of the creative juices in his being were gone. And so the lack of peace forced him to put down his brushes, go find the man and ask his forgiveness. And only then did he have the inner calm needed to do the face of his master. But while anger is often a misused emotion, there is the proper anger that Jesus expressed here. An anger against, as we have said, the injustices, the exploitation, Anger against those things that work against the work of God in our world. And such righteous anger is not only legitimate, it is necessary. For if we are not able to become angry at the wrongs of our world, more than likely we will not be able to love that world as God calls us to love it. For our very capacity towards a proper anger, is often tied to love, just as it was for Jesus on that day. A friend of ours used to teach at Fuller Seminary, now involved in philanthropic work, Walt Hansen, told a story in Christianity Today a number of years ago about an angry outburst he had when he was 10 years of age. Some teenagers were tormenting his brother, Kenny, who had Down syndrome. And Walt says when they began to pick on his Down syndrome brother, he went ballistic. He started screaming at the teenagers, scratching, even biting them. And when the lifeguard pulled him off and asked him to apologize and to say he was sorry, Walt refused to do it. He was defending his powerless brother against powerful bullies. His love for his brother was so great that anger was the response. And then he adds, as he reflects on this, he said, but only now is my anger mixed with grief and compassion over those who were so stunted emotionally that they were insensitive to the needs of precious people like my Down syndrome brother. There is a proper anger. And it is at the cross that anger and love met.
And that indeed is what God calls us to, I think, in our own lives. It's hard for us to put those two together. We don't see great examples and models of love. We certainly don't see many great examples of righteous indignation. But it was indeed the anger towards sin that made Jesus willing to go to the cross. And as he bore the sins of the world, and as he took upon him all of the penalty that naturally belonged to us, as he took upon himself God's own righteous indignation, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it was his love, the love that triumphed over sin at the cross, that enabled Jesus to look down at the people who had nailed him there and to say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they have done. In the cross, anger and love met. And Jesus calls us to the life of holiness in which they meet in our lives every day. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess we don't know love very well, and we certainly don't know the meaning of anger very well. Somehow in your majesty and holiness, you demonstrated it that day so long ago at the temple and at the cross. And God, we ask that somehow as we once again live, live this week and relive the wonderful events of more than 2,000 years ago, that you will renew our hearts and renew our minds so that we will follow you faithfully. Send us forth, Lord, with righteous indignation and holy love to be your people in a broken, sinful world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.